Welcome back to another installment of Space This Week. We have a super jam-packed episode today with lots of exciting progress being made at Starbase for the fourth flight of Starship and there have been some really interesting orbital launches too, including a lunar support mission from China, a star shield mission from SpaceX and a crewed launch to the ISS from Roscosmos. Furthermore, NASA are making headway with their Artemis and Lunar Gateway programs and we're about to say goodbye forever to one of the greatest rockets of all time. All of this and a whole lot more. Enjoy and let's get things rolling with Starship updates. SpaceX are wasting no time with proceeding with readying Starship for Flight Test 4. Last week, we saw the next Starship for flight, Ship 29, lifted onto the ship transportation stand in the high bay before it was then ceremoniously rolled down to the launch site and lifted onto the static fire pad, formerly suborbital pad B, using the two-point load lifter. We suspected that the next test in line for this ship would be a static fire, given that it's already conducted a successful spin prime test, and SpaceX later confirmed that this would indeed be the plan. And so we all eagerly awaited for the static fire with bated breath, because after the static fire, this vehicle will be ready for launch. Its final test will presumably be a full stack wet dress rehearsal with the booster. For those new to all of this, a static fire test is a test in which the engines are ignited, or you know, fired, but the vehicle doesn't lift off as it would during a live launch, it remains static, hence static fire. Just throwing in the translation for those unaware, I realise there are a lot of acronyms and jargon in these videos sometimes that for newcomers it might as well be a foreign language, and trust me, I've never been very good at learning new languages. At least until I tried Babbel, who have sponsored today's video. It's one of the world's best language learning apps, used by over 10 million users worldwide, teaching you real-world conversations in lessons designed by real language teachers. I've had some amazing opportunities travelling to other countries as part of this whole YouTube thing, meeting subscribers when I visited Space Creator Day in Germany, and meeting rivals at the French KSB esports event. It was great, but it could have been even better if my grasp of their languages was a little bit better than it currently is. Bonjour, je m'appelle Malin. That's the only French I really know, to be honest. <laughs> So I'd really like to brush up on my French and German and Babbel makes this super easy thanks to its expertly crafted and immersive lessons that are scientifically proven to get you started speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Oui, bien sûr. Yes. And if you're watching this, then you can get 60% off your subscription. Just follow the link in the description box or pinned comment and start speaking a new language in three weeks with Babbel. Sponsors like Babbel help me keep on doing what I do here, so massive thanks to them for sponsoring today's video. Over at the launch site, it looks like some pretty significant works are happening at the orbital launch pad. Workers were seen removing the hood of the booster quick disconnect system, which was followed by the removal of several umbilical lines that supply the super heavy booster with propellant. Now we saw a similar thing happen in the days that followed Starship Flight Test 2 as well, so it looks like SpaceX still have some work to do in order to prevent these lines from sustaining damage during an orbital launch. So with Ship 29 about to undertake its final round of solo testing, when Flight 4? Well, according to SpaceX boss Gwyn Shotwell, speaking at Satellite Conference and Exhibition 2024 on Tuesday, she estimated that SpaceX will be ready in as little as six weeks, which is a very impressive turnaround speed from Flight 3, especially as we're still only in the prototype testing stage of Starship's development. But rapid progress is par for the course at Starbase. To give you a great sense of the scale of the operations, Elon Musk shared an aerial photograph of Starbase last week, providing an excellent view of the now gigantic star factory building that's steadily dominating the production site. Sad news now, the OG Super Heavy Booster 4 has been standing for almost three whole years now if you can believe it. It and Ship 20 formed the first ever full stack of the Starship integrated vehicle, but the two were never flown due to the fact they were very rapidly becoming outdated and only sported the aging Raptor 1 engine design, instead of the Raptor 2 seen on all subsequent prototypes, as well as a litany of other features. We wondered what the fate of these two vehicles would eventually be, and for Booster 4 at least, it's all over now. Things began with its rollout from the Rocket Garden last week, where it was then transported down to the Mega Bay. Once inside, it was lifted and then cut in half, and both sections were separated. 
Further breakdown of the two halves will no doubt continue throughout the week. So far, all three Starship launches have ended with a rapid unscheduled disassembly, but generally, ground tests always go without a hitch. But last week, NASA Spaceflight's McGregor Live livestream captured the moment when a Raptor 2 engine was tested at the tripod stand, swiftly followed by a rather energetic end to the test. Whether or not this was an intentional test to destruction is impossible to say, but it was certainly unexpected. Now, I was pretty happy about wrapping up my Starship coverage for this video there, but literally right before I was about to hit the render button, we started seeing frosting appear on ship 29, indicating the loading of cryogenic propellants and therefore imminent static fire. So now I'm adding this bit in because, spoiler alert, we saw one. Watching carefully, we can see the spin-up gas of just the central three Raptor 2 engines, followed by ignition. But I suspect that in fact we actually saw all six ignite, it's just the central three fired first. Watching carefully, you can see the bright ignition of the center three happen, but then right here, the area suddenly spikes in brightness, likely suggesting the then ignition of the outer three RVACs. That, plus look at how much dust this thing kicked up. I am definitely going to go with saying that it looks like six engines here, but let me know what you think in the comments down below. And hey, if you're enjoying the coverage so far, then don't forget to leave a like on the video, as it does really help channels out. Working with NASA, SpaceX launched the 30th commercial resupply mission of a Cargo Dragon spacecraft to the International Space Station last week. The Falcon 9 lifted off from Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral on the 21st of March, carrying roughly two and a half tons of resupplies and scientific experiments to the station. This was the first time Dragon 2 has ever launched from Launch Complex 40, after SpaceX completed the installation of the Crew Access Tower and Arm. In fact, last week they shared a fun video of them testing the new emergency chutes from the top of the tower. These basically serve as a rapid means of evacuation for crew members to quickly get clear of the rocket in case of an anomaly that could cause a threat to life. So while I'm sure whizzing down the slide might be a lot of fun, I'm not sure how much the prospect of being obliterated by an exploding Falcon 9 may hamper the experience. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to the CRS-30 mission. The Dragon successfully autonomously docked to the Harmony Zenith port the following day, while the Falcon 9's first stage successfully performed a boost back burn after stage separation that got it all the way back to the mainland, coming to rest at landing zone 1 at the Cape, wrapping up its sixth overall flight. NASA showed off this cool footage of the rollout of a Soyuz 2.1A rocket from its integration building, and it has a launch escape tower, meaning that this will be carrying crew. Yep, this was the rollout of Expedition 71's vehicle to the launch pad at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. The crew consisted of NASA astronaut Tracy Dyson, Soyuz Commander Oleg Novitsky of Roscosmos, and spaceflight participant Marina Vasilevskaya of Belarus. The rocket eventually launched on the 23rd of March, after suffering from a launch abort on the 21st, after a power generator suffered a voltage drop. The spacecraft docked to the station's pre module earlier today, here's a POV of it approximately 60 metres from the port. Tracy Dyson will return to Earth in September this year, but Oleg Novinsky and Marina Vasilevskaya will depart after just 12 days, aboard the Soyuz MS-24 spacecraft with NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara. Last Tuesday saw the first of the two SpaceX Starlink missions for the week. This was Starlink Group 7-16, launching from the Vandenberg Space Force Base, but interestingly, the Falcon 9 only carried 20 Starlink satellites in order to make room for two Star Shield satellites as rideshare payloads, designated USA-350 and 351. Starshield is a separate division of SpaceX's Starlink, first announced in 2022 following the extensive utilization of Starlink in the Ukraine war. Starlink itself will remain a civilian service, while Starshield sports additional features that meet the requirements for mobile military systems including encryption and anti-jam capabilities, and is designed for government and military agencies controlled by the United States Space Force. In total, SpaceX estimates Starshield will comprise of 200 plus and satellites. Last week, the satellites were successfully delivered to low Earth orbit, while the first stage made its 10th overall landing, touching down on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship in the Pacific Ocean. 
The second Starlink mission was yesterday, the 24th, and this was Starlink Group 6-42. A slightly more standard affair Starlink mission, this launch consisted of 23 Starlink V2 satellites, and this particular Falcon 9 first stage made its 19th total landing, coming down onto the Just Read the Instructions drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. Rocket Lab conducted a launch for the USA's National Reconnaissance Office last Wednesday. The Electron carried the Razor 5 satellite to low Earth orbit from the Wallops Flight Facility's Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, marking the first NRO launch on an Electron from the US. Naturally, because it's an NRO payload, it's completely classified, so not a lot is really known about it, but the NRO have suggested that the mission will be to conduct some kind of technology demonstration. NASA released this cool little hype piece last week, or as they call it, Gateway Lunar Space Station Trailer. Now, it's only 37 seconds long, and as far as I can tell, it doesn't contain much new original footage, if any at all, that we haven't seen in previous media releases. But nonetheless, I thought I'd mention it and show the footage here because it did make me excited, though then again, it's hard to not be excited about the idea of a space station orbiting the moon. In their press release of the trailer, NASA noted that the Gateway Space Station will be humanity's first space station to orbit the moon in support of the Artemis missions to return humans to the lunar surface for scientific discovery and chart a path for the first human missions to Mars and beyond. NASA continued their testing of Aerojet Rocketdyne's upgraded RS-25 engines, which they hope to enter service as the main engines for the SLS rocket for Artemis V. Last week's test took place on the 22nd of March at the John C. Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. This was the 10th of 12 planned hot fire tests in this, the final round of certification testing, ahead of production of the upgraded engines, and it was the fourth test to feature a new production engine nozzle to provide additional performance data for the engine. The hot fire test lasted 500 seconds in total, with the engine running at up to 113% power level. We had a couple of launches from China last week. The first was a pretty exciting one, in support of China's robotic lunar rover program. The payload was the Keqiao-2 relay satellite, which will provide communication services for the Chang'e 4, 6, 7 and 8 lunar missions. It was carried to its lunar orbit trajectory by a Long March 8 rocket from the Wenchang Launch Center in China's Hainan province last Wednesday. In addition to the primary payload, the rocket also carried the Tiandu-1 and 2 satellites, which will test technologies for future lunar navigation operated by Nanjing University's Deep Space Exploration Laboratory. The other Chinese launch of the week took place the next day, when a Long March 2D launched from the Jiquan Satellite launch site carrying six Yunhai-2 satellites to low Earth orbit. The Yunhai series of satellites are operated by the China Academy of Space Technology, and according to them, the satellites will be mainly used in the fields of detection of atmospheric environmental elements, space environment monitoring, disaster prevention and mitigation, and scientific experiments. So, rather broad range of uses there. <laughs> Coming up this week is kind of a sad launch. United Launch Alliance's Delta IV Heavy, the world's largest operational rocket and the most metal of all launch vehicles, will be making its final ever launch on Thursday, so mark your calendars for that. I did decide to pay tribute to this beast of a launch vehicle in my most recent Kerbal Space Program 2 video, so if you've not seen that yet, then definitely go and check that one out. I was pretty happy with how the video and my recreation of the Delta IV Heavy came together. But this video that you're watching now is, is over, basically. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it, and big thank you for clicking on it and watching it. If you want to support my channel, then I have a Patreon you can join, just like the great people on the left did. And if you want to see more from me, then there are two video cards you can give a little click and check out if you think they look cool but yeah that's it from me i'll be back on saturday for more regularly scheduled kerbal content goodbye